Lord Jesus, we um, need so much in life, even the story that was just read for us that we look at in scripture, the story of real people with real needs, but the needs were more diverse than we could ever imagine. Um, and Jesus as Savior is more powerful than we ever imagined. So we pray that in our hearts, in our lives, you are honored through our response to your mercy. We pray this in your name. Amen. So have you ever been caught off guard by something emotionally? I've spent most of my life as a pretty, uh, you know, stable emotional person. And I say stable in that my wife often just calls me a robot because I don't really respond like most humans do in any specific situation. Um, but as I've gotten older, I've found these things that some of you know called emotions. Um, and I feel like a robot who's slowly becoming self-aware and these things catch me off guard at times. And so in essence, what I see in my daughter, who's eight years old, processing all of her emotions uh, in the confines of a loving home and parents and where it's socially acceptable to just have, you know, crying and temper tantrums, I'm processing all those things as a 35-year-old, 34-year-old guy in the midst of you guys. And so this leads to some awkward encounters at times, uh, both with you and in our own home. There are times where uh, I'll be watching a movie with my family, and it'll be some Disney movie, and there's all this drama and tension in the plot, and then all the characters kind of begin to address one another in a sort of cadence and then there's some rhythm that happens, and then pretty soon everyone is singing, and I'm sitting there just weeping. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm struck by the beauty and the cooperation in the midst of life's sorrows, and uh, I, I, I have no idea. I think it's payback for all the times where when my wife was pregnant, I'd walk by the bathroom, and she'd just be weeping, watching like Charmin commercials on YouTube. Um, and so I'm experiencing that now, and the story we have in Luke today is a story that includes a similar type of response. There are 10 men who are healed, and one man has an unsuspecting emotional reaction which seems totally unfitting in light of what actually happened and what they've been freed to go and do. As a whole world was opened up to these 10 men who suffered from leprosy, one man turned away from the world and turned back to Jesus because of a profound change in his emotions. His response obviously didn't make sense to the other nine people. And as you read this text, and maybe perhaps as we exposit it together and look at what did happen when Jesus cleansed them and what did await them in the temple, you might find his response to be entirely unfitting as well. And yet it's this man, this one who turns back, who Jesus holds up to us as an example of how we ought to respond to him. But this is not primarily by calling us to do what the Samaritan did, but instead, with the help of Luke as the author, Jesus is going to show us what the Samaritan leper believed. And what we believe always shapes our actions. And this is going to be our main point this morning, and it's this. When Jesus is the source of our salvation, he becomes the subject of our adoration, when Jesus is the source of our salvation, he becomes the subject of our adoration. So there are 10 men who sought Jesus today as a source of what we see in the opening verses of mercy. But that mercy had an acute response on one of those men. And so what we want to do together today is to examine the nature of the mercy of Jesus that is at play in this text so that we might see and believe and by God's grace respond as the one Samaritan leper. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Luke 17 and we're going to see that Jesus' mercy is four things. It is first to be sought after. Second, it is cleansing. Third, it is stupefying. And lastly, it is scandalous. And so Luke's gospel, as we work through it, is set up geographically. Luke is a guy who would have always had his GPS open. He's interested in his surroundings, and it flows towards Jerusalem. That's kind of the structure of the book. It's flowing to the cross as this intentional point of not only geography, but of time. And then Luke's, gospel, or Luke's book of Acts goes from Jerusalem and the cross to the nations. And so there's intentional movement, and our text today uh, picks up on this intentional movement. Luke tells us this in verse 11 and 12. He says, on the way to Jerusalem, as he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, he, that's Jesus, was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance. 
And so these might be, as we read, just like casual markers of where we are and what's happening in the story. And it certainly does inform us, but we shouldn't rush past these things. All of this is God's word. All of this is good for us. And what we see here, when we understand what Luke is doing and how he's oriented his book, is we see Jesus on his way to something keenly important, being interrupted by people who are unimportant. One poet commented on the pace of our own modern lives today. And he said, the great tragedy of speed as an answer to the complexities and responsibilities of existence is that very soon we cannot recognize anything or anyone who is not traveling at the same velocity as we are. Soon, we begin to suffer a form of amnesia, that's forgetfulness, caused by the blurred vision of velocity itself. I love that line, the blurred vision of velocity. If you're a parent, or if you have nieces and nephews, or if you've just been in our church after church on Sunday, you might be perhaps doing some very adult thing only to have a child come and ask you to reach for their third cookie off of the table. And in that moment, our blurred vision of velocity causes us to perhaps overlook that, to think there are important things happening right now. Do I really care that some child is smashing Johnny's guitar on here when I'm talking to somebody else about something adultish? But here, Jesus, who is on his way to the most important task the world will ever know, the cross where he makes propitiation for our sin and reconciles us to God, he stops. We already know, because Luke has told us, that Jesus is under great distress, he says, until the cross comes. So in a sense, Jesus could just see it as like ripping off a band-aid. He could rush straight to Jerusalem to get to the cross. But this Jesus, our Jesus, is encountering 10 men whom the world had forgotten, blurred by the velocity of life, but these are not 10 men that Jesus will forget. And here we see the heart of of Jesus, and we begin to understand why these men called out to Jesus for something which is at the very center of his nature, that is, mercy. They cried out to the one who stops for the forgotten, who pauses for the hurting, and they ask him for mercy. And this is our first point this morning. Jesus' mercy is to be sought after. And this is what we see here. As Jesus is going, verse 13 tells us these men stood at a distance, lifting up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Wrapped up in this request for mercy, um, the men show us two things that they knew. First, they knew that Jesus was a special sort of person who offered a special sort of mercy. And so if you look at uh, what we've read so far in the book of Luke, that title, Master, has only been used um, almost exclusively by those who are Jesus' closest disciples. So these men had a keen understanding of who Jesus was. They didn't just see him as a random person. They had a unique sense of allegiance that they called out to him for because they needed a special sort of mercy. He was a unique figure in their lives. So they knew something about Jesus. But secondly, their call for mercy communicated what they also knew about themselves. They were in need. They needed help. They were the ones with the problem, and they knew that Jesus was the one with the solution. And so what was their problem? Well, it's obvious in the text, isn't it? It was chiefly that they all had leprosy. Leprosy is a skin disease that would cause sores on your flesh, and oftentimes we could spend a lot of time talking about how terrible it was. It would fall off your body. You'd have open wounds. It would stink. It would rot. But it's almost so wildly outlandish that we minimize it. So think of it as this. Leprosy is a blister. Think about how inconvenienced your life is when you have a single blister. When you're hiking, maybe I just went golfing for the first time in like 75 years the other day. I have a blister on my hand. And it's so incredibly irritating. Leprosy is like having a blister on your whole body that constantly bursts open, that has no hope, of ever being healed forever. That's the devastating pain of leprosy. But more than that, there was a relational reality behind this. Because leprosy was physically contagious, God in his grace gave Israel a healthcare program. 
And the healthcare program uh, was to isolate those who were contagious and deadly to God's people by putting them outside and treating them in a safe way. They had to be sent outside the camp and outside the community until they were made clean so that they could re-enter it. There was no antibiotics. There was no, no vaccine they could give these people to heal them. They just had to trust time and maybe some good old-fashioned baths, and that never produced anything. Leviticus 13 shows us that a leper had to dress in a distinct way. So even when they're coming from far off, you could tell who they were. They would have long hair, torn clothes. And if for some reason they had to go into town, perhaps to even present themselves to the priest, which we'll see today, they were to cover their upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. Leviticus 13 verse 46 tells us that their dwelling was outside the camp. So not only were these people who were living in constant, unbearable pain, but there are people who lived as complete outsiders, outside the community of God's people, outside the realm of their own families. They were outsiders. And that's why Luke tells us here that they stood at a distance and called out to Jesus. They knew they were in need. They knew Jesus was the only one who could help them. And because their pain was obvious so was their need. And the same is true for us. We will never cry out to Jesus until we see the depth of our own problem. We will never seek out Jesus for mercy unless we think we actually need it. We sing songs about grace. We sing songs about mercy. But how many of us live our lives not really thinking we need either of those? Not really understanding that we are the ones with a devastating disease. And so in God's providence, since page three of the Bible where Adam and Eve sinned, what we've learned is that every discomfort of life is on account of sin, which means every discomfort, every pain, every hardship you encounter, every rainy day, every graveside service, every burnt tongue, every blister on your choco reminds you that you need mercy, that we have a need in this world that nothing can heal. We need mercy because we are sinners. These lepers came because they had a physical blemish which was devastating, but we, each and every one of us, come to Jesus because we have a spiritual blemish which is even more gruesome and more deadly. More deadly to the community. More contagious to the community. Paul tells us in Titus 3.3, he speaks of all of us. That's not just those who grew up in a non-Christian home and, you know, listen to rock music. This is anyone who was ever born at all time. It says, he says this, he says, you were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. It's a real emotional butt slap for us all this morning. But there's a yuck factor to leprosy, which we often don't have in relation to our own sin. But our sin festered in our souls. It put us at odds with God and at odds with one another. And this is far more dangerous than any condition of the skin. And so seeing leprosy is in one sense helpful because it's obvious. We can see it. But the danger of sin is that we can't see it. You could look at an open wound and say something's wrong with that individual. You could come here. You could put on a white polo and look all nice and clean. And no one will know, perhaps not even yourself, that there is a dangerous disease in your soul. But just like these men, anyone who comes to Jesus must seek him because they know they need his healing touch. They need Jesus to cleanse him, not as a booster shot, not as a badge of community belonging, but as a source of comprehensive healing from the effects of sin. And this healing is what Jesus called these men to pursue. Look at verse 14, he says this, he says, when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And so here we see, again, a glimpse in how desperately these men were looking for mercy. Um, My wife and kids were watching Uh, Little House on the Prairie, and we're not even homeschooled. And they were watching Little House on the Prairie the other day, and uh, there is this scene where um, they're all in the little house that's on the prairie. And uh, 
they hear these war drums coming and uh, there's this ominous tone of uh, the Native Americans are coming and they haven't had many encounters so they don't know what to do. And so in light of this, the, the dad looks at the kids and he says, go get on the bed. And immediately, all of the kids go get on the bed. And my wife, being a keen, apt parent, wanting to give away the grace of the gospel and robust, robust richness, looks at my kids and says, why don't you obey like that? <laughs> But the humor tells us the point, right? We know why these kids obeyed. Because there is a real imminent need. They knew that danger was imminent, their need was great, and their only recourse was obedience. And that's what we see here. These men were driven by a need, whether they thought it would work or not. All Jesus said, he didn't say, you're healed, go. He's done that at different points in the gospel. Instead, he says, go and show yourself to the priests. Now, in that time, what would happen is if someone thought they were cleansed from leprosy, they would go to the priest, and the priest would look at them, and he would assess them, and he would declare them to be clean. And these men, whether it made sense to them or not, left merely at Jesus' command to go and present themselves. They were not cleansed as they stood there. They did not look at one another and see that their skin had miraculously been healed. They looked at one another as they turned and went, knowing that unless something changed, when they presented themselves to the priest, they would in fact be declared unclean. Nothing had changed. That they would certainly still face rejection. But despite that, they went. Why? because they knew they needed mercy. And there was no one or nothing else that gave them a better shot. They had reached, just as anyone who truly comes to faith in Jesus, the end of themselves. They had reached the end of their intellect. They had reached the end of their bean counting and legalistic nitpicking. And because of that, Luke tells us in verse 14, that as they went, they were cleansed. And this is Jesus' second point this morning. Jesus' mercy, it's, I guess it's not Jesus' point, it's my point um, of what we see in, in Jesus' words here. Uh, Jesus' mercy is cleansing. As they left, they were cleansed. Once unclean in visible, physical, smellable ways, they were now cleansed. Can you imagine what that would be like? Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have been nauseous. And you, could, um, you know the moment where finally, after hours or maybe days, your stomach finally settles. We can feel it in our bodies. Imagine if your disease was this great. What would it be like to have felt healing from a disease in that moment? Would you have seen the wounds on your other nine friends being sealed in front of you? Would you have felt a renewed sense of strength? What would it have been like for these people who every physical touch on their body produced searing pain for as they're trotting to the temple, their feet no longer hurt. Their pace could quicken without any sort of searing pain. What would that have been like? And notice the words Jesus and Luke use. Once this work was called a healing, but twice it was called a cleansing. Now, why is that distinct? It's distinct because not only did Jesus heal them, but his healing was so profound that these men knew that what, what stood out for them when they reached the temple was not just, hey, you're healed, but hey, you're cleansed. You're able to re-enter into this community. You have new life available to you. You see, Jesus still abided by the law. They needed to, um, in the flesh, go and present themselves to the priest in order to be rejoined into society. But take note here, the law and human priests can only declare something clean. But Jesus, the great high priest, made them clean. What can wash away our sins? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can cleanse us from our sins. 
Nothing can do that. Not your spouse when you've cheated against them and they give you forgiveness. Not your brink when you've defrauded them and you've paid it back. Not the world when you've come into their ideological lane of thought. None of those people can make you clean. But Jesus' mercy can. It can make you clean when you come to him for it. Now, I was sharing the gospel with a friend of mine who's not a believer the other week. And as I was talking about the gospel itself and miracles and transformation and new life, she almost stopped me and said, now this just seems like a fable. And it does, doesn't it? This past Sunday, I stood at a graveside service in a cemetery with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of graves. And I said, one day death will lose its teeth forever. One day what's in these graves will rise up. Have you ever done that? Probably not. It's probably a rare niche. (laughs) But you never feel so stupid as standing in the midst of dead bones saying they will rise. It sounds like a fable. But you know what delineates fables from the gospel? Jesus. (laughs) When dead people start rising, when lepers start getting healed, when miracles flow from the nature and power of Jesus. Things stop being fables when they prove themselves to be true. And here truly these men were healed by the same man who would truly rise out of the grave himself in resurrection glory. Friends, there really is power in the mercy of Jesus. But you've got to respond to it by finding the end of yourself. You have to feel a little bit foolish following it. That the gospel and the mercy of Jesus is where any attempts to earn our own healing, any attempts to solve our own condition must go to die. Because we are surrendering it all and saying in this one person and at his word is my only hope. You see, our own understanding, which we tend to cling to before going to Jesus, where has it gotten us? Nowhere. We understand a lot of things today. And yet things aren't getting better. Our hearts aren't healing themselves. But here is Jesus who heals. Here is real power. If you feel trapped in sin, if you feel like you've been white knuckling and wrist slapping and eye gouging, even according to Jesus' commands, if you feel trapped, know here that Jesus really does change you. He really does cleanse you. He really does give you mercy. And how does he do it? By coming to him and asking for it. By seeking him for mercy. There is hope for those who feel incurable. There is healing for those who feel held captive by something that can never be changed. And how can you be confident that Jesus will do it? Well, because one, we see it in this story. Jesus was so confident. He, and what does everyone want to do right now? They all want to slander Jesus. They just want one, Jesus make one wrong move and then it's done. And what does Jesus do? He tells 10 people who certainly would be turned away if nothing changed. He says, go and make it public. Go and show yourself to the priests. And do you realize that Jesus says the same kind of thing to those who come to him in faith? Romans 12, Paul says this. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Jesus says to all who come to him in faith, go and show yourself, not to the priests, not to your spouse, not to your pastors, but to God himself, to the one to whom all of our sin is a grievous offense, to the one whose holiness consumes that which is evil and wicked, that is that which is true to our own hearts. And by what posture do you all do all of this? Did you see that in Romans 12? How do we present ourselves? By the mercies of of God. What chance do you have to stand before God Almighty to be declared clean except the mercy of Jesus? Do you realize you have no more a shot of finding cleansing or community or redemption on your own than a leper does 
of changing his own skin. We need Jesus's mercy. We need a heart which cries out for cleaning through faith. And when we do that, brothers and sisters, we are made new. We are restored. We are pardoned. We are cleansed. Have you experienced that? Have you sought Jesus for his mercy? We can seek Jesus for a thousand things, but only one thing saves, and that is to seek him for his mercy, to save us from our death caused by sin. But if you have experienced this, this is not the end of the story. The men were cleansed in verse two, but turns out the Bible rolls on. This is our third point this morning. Jesus' mercy is stupefying. And here we'll see this great divide. There are some people who don't know what stupefying is. There's some people who like to read old English, and there's some people who read Harry Potter. And all of you are right to a specific degree. This is a word we don't commonly use today. In 1828, Noah Webster defined it as saying, rending something as extremely dull or insensible. Giving as an example, he says, the stupefying value of opium. It it numbs, it deadens, it makes silly. To be stupefied is to be made insensible, out of your own mind. And what we see in this very text is this one leper was made stupid, unfeeling to the things of the world on account of the rich gratitude he had towards Jesus, the one who healed him. Remember what just happened. These men were cut off from their families. At best, what life would have been like as a leper is maybe their family would have come outside the city and seen them at a distance. But they would have been completely indistinguishable. Not only do they have to have long hair and tattered clothes, but their skin is quite literally falling off of their bodies. Were they even to have somebody so bold as to go violate the law, to go give them a hug or a kiss, the physical affection would have brought with it only searing pain and reminder of their own problem. That's at best. At worst, as soon as someone has leprosy, they're sent outside the gates of the city. They've been forgotten and scorned. They've been feared and they've been neglected. But now, someone cleansed them. Now the door that had long been shut, the hug that was forever off limits, the embrace and the acceptance that always stood on the other side of the wall, it was finally removed. What would you do if right now, whatever you perceive the biggest problem in your life was, was removed? What would you do? Who would you talk to? How would you spend your time? What would you do if your disease was cured? If your debts were paid? What would you do if what waited in front of you was the life you had always hoped for and never dreamt would actually be a reality? Well, we see what one of them did, don't we? With all that on the table, Luke 17, 15 says this, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Do you hear the cascading tone of Luke's words? Of affectionate gratitude and radical reorientation. The grammar of this text is vague. It just tells us when he saw he was healed. We don't know how long that was in terms of distance or time from when he spoke to Jesus. We can assume given the contrast Jesus is going to build out, that it was before he actually made it to the priest. But here's what we do know. That it was when he was healed. Which means this. It means when it would have been the easiest to return to his old life. When he would have been the strongest to return to his family. When it would have been the least painful to reopen his business. He turned back. He turned away from the things of the world, not because they were wicked, not because he couldn't return, but because there was a new priority in his life. He ran back to Jesus. 
One commentator said, he said, the nine others were already healed and hastening to the priests that they might be restored to the society of men and their life in the world. But the first thoughts of the Samaritan are turned to his deliverer. I love this. He had forgotten all in the sense of God's mercy and his own unworthiness. If we're honest with ourselves, how many times do we pursue Jesus in order to get what we need to get back to our own lives? How many times is Jesus a tool for our own ideals of what the best life should be in relationship to our families, our careers, our vacations, our financial security? Remember right before this, when Stephen preached two weeks ago, we saw servants who responded to their master. He says, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. But here we see the beauty of Christian duty. It's always the duty of delight. You see, in that text, if you look back just right ahead in verse 10, it's not the master who speaks out to remind the servants of who they are. He's not, hey, servants, quit asking for things. You're just a servant. You did your duty. It's the servants who remind themselves of the delight of their duty. They're like, we get to do this. We get to serve the master. This is what we've been tasked to. This is the beautiful slavery of salvation, is serving a master this good. This man's return shows the delight of our new life in service to Jesus, the one who heals. It was no obligatory southern hospitality. Look at how Luke described this. He turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. This man knew three things. First, he knew that he was a leper. He then knew the reality which was open to him by his healing. He knew the reward of leprosy being undone, of acceptance, of relational warmth, of minimal pain. But then he knew a third thing. He knew the man who stood in the middle. He knew the man who dealt with his leprosy and opened the gates of splendor. And his only response to that was gratitude. Unconscious, uncontrollable gratitude. And Jesus looks at this man and he says, this is the one in his right mind. Verses 17 and 18, he says, we're not 10 cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? We talk about thankless jobs all the time. The guys who scrub the porta potties, it's a thankless job. The person who raises those half dozen chickens that I eat in three minutes for my plate of wings, that's a thankless job. The people who go and work on power lines and sub zero temperatures, that's a thankless job. You'd think the man who just healed you from a terminal and incurable disease and opened up to you life and joy and happiness would not be a thankless job. But this is what our hearts do. We take the gift and we run from the giver. We exchange mercy for merit, undeserved grace for a deserved reward. You see, we can debate what these other men did. We can say, did they have the same amount of faith as the one who returned? Did they receive the same mercy as the one who returned? But why? To what end? This story is not about them. This story is about the one who came back. You could look at your life and you can assess everything. What have I done? Did I do it right? But the, 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 the weight of the text is to say, but come back now. Realize what Jesus has done. Show yourself to him. We should be like the one who comes back. We should be the ones who never forget who we were. We never forget what Jesus has done. And now we are made new on account of that. When the blurred vision of velocity settles in your life, when you take a break from the pace of work and of friends and of vacations and of summers, when you consider the weight of the gospel, it must produce in you humble gratitude to realize the end of ourselves and the beginning of grace. And it must follow that the more we think about mercy, the more merciful it becomes. The more we think about Jesus' beauty, the more beautiful he becomes. Because that's who Jesus is. That's how our mercy is, through Jesus. And this is our final point this morning. Jesus' mercy is scandalous. It's scandalous. And I've kind of brushed over this, and maybe you've noticed this. 
because Luke brings it to our attention three times that this man was a Samaritan. Tell us first when Jesus is passing between the border of Samaria and Galilee. And for those of you who have just kind of joined us or don't quite understand the context here, between the Samaritans and Jews, there was great conflict. That conflict was first racial because the Samaritans were half-blood Jews. They're the ones who intermarried with the pagan foreigners and they're the one who proved the biggest existential crisis to Jewish life. But it was also ethical. They and their offspring came from a violation of God's goal for them. And so they saw them as ethically unclean. And then it was also spiritual. These Samaritans had their own place to go and worship Jesus in relationship and intention to where the Jews worshiped in Jerusalem. But leprosy, like no, or like sin, knows no bounds. Sin does not care. Death does not care. Leprosy does not care if you are white or black, if you're from Ecuador, or if you're from Uzbekistan. And Jesus draws this point out of the scandal of this in verse 18 when he says, was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigners? They were both Jews, Jews and Samaritans in this group, and the Samaritan came back. And maybe that's because the Jews... Kind of like when I make a meal for my kids, they don't often thank me. But if I have a kid's friend over, the kid's friend thanks me. Why? Because he realizes, like, they're not my parents. They don't have to feed me. (laughs) And maybe that's the arrogance the Jews had. Of course, Jesus healed us. We're Jewish lepers. He's the Jewish Messiah. But the Samaritan had maybe a better understanding of, I don't deserve anything from him. I am morally, spiritually, ethically impure according to the cultural standards of the day. The Samaritan knew there was nothing in him worthy of Jesus' mercy. He had no right to the Messiah's power. He had nothing deserving of Jesus' promise. And so when the healing happened, he was overwhelmed, not only with the size of grace, but the scandal of it that saved a wretch like him. The British pastor J.C. Ryle says, Thankfulness is a flower which will never bloom well, excepting upon a root of deep humility. Do you realize that all of us are Samaritans? All of us are lepers. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus comes to each of us. And when we cry out to mercy, he answers. Notice what Jesus says to the man in verse 19. He says, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. And here's the real thrust of the story. The man was already cleansed. If you have your Bibles open, Luke says he's cleansed in verse 14. Jesus himself says he's cleansed in verse 17. But here Jesus says it a new way. He says, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. It's almost a reissuing of the command he gave back in verse 14. Go and show. But the position of it is distinct, isn't it? He says, rise and go. He's releasing him to kind of go where he was already commissioned to go. But why? He says, because your faith has made you well. That verb is not the same verb Luke uses for cleansing in verse 14 or 17. Neither is it the word he uses for healing in verse 15. It's a word, and depending upon your Bible translations you have today, it's just simply the Greek word for salvation. Your translation might say, go because your faith has saved you. Saved? Saved from what? He was already healed. His leprosy was already cured. So what was he saved from? He was saved from the, what blinded those other men to the heart of gratitude. He was saved to the blurred vision of philosophy. He was saved from praiselessness. He was saved from leprosy. He was saved from death itself. Why and how? Because his faith has made him well. His faith in Jesus has saved him. You see, the miracle of this text is not that 10 men were saved from a devastating disease, but that one man was saved from a devastating distance. Did you see that? Again, Luke is the geometry guy. He loves this. Follow this when Luke talks about this. This man's greatest problem, look back at the text, this man's greatest problem in verse 12 was not how he stood as a leper, but where he stood at a distance. He didn't need to be restored by healing. He needed to be restored to the healer. 
That's the reality that radically reoriented his emotions and sent him back. He no longer stood at a distance. His petition for mercy no longer caused him to stop a ways off. He didn't wait for the priest to clear him. Why? Because Jesus already did. He threw himself, cleansed by faith, face first on the feet of Jesus. The first touch he wanted to know in his redeemed body was the only touch capable of saving. Before he was embraced by the world, he would suffer not the embrace of the one who created the world. This story is not about leprosy. Who had leprosy? Who was cleansed? All of them were. This is a story about a man who refused to present himself to a human priest for worthy acceptance before he presented himself to the great high priest out of deep adoration. This is a man who realized something that the gospel calls all of us to realize. There are 11, not 10 healings in this text. 10 men were healed from leprosy. One man was healed from blindness. His eyes were open to see the true nature of Jesus, the reality of his sins. And out of that reality, the reality that is ours in the gospel of Jesus, the emotions and affections flowed as naturally out of his heart as his sores were from his skin. It had been reordered. The Puritan pastor Jonathan Edwards says this. He says, if the great things of religion are rightly understood, they will affect the heart. The reason why men are not affected by such infinitely great, important, glorious, and wonderful things as they often hear and read of in God's word is undoubtedly because they are blind. If they were not so, it would be impossible and utterly inconsistent with human nature that their hearts should be otherwise strongly impressed and greatly moved by such things. If we understand what Jesus did, we respond emotionally. No one tells you to be in awe at a sunset. No one tells you that chicken wings are delicious. These are things we just intuitively know. It's natural to our world for the sun to rise and set, for our ozone layer to reflect light in a hue of different colors, for our taste buds to respond to sugars and to fats. That is natural. It is unnatural that the king of the world would move towards those sick with sin and touch them by his hand, move to the cross, die for their penalty, give them his life to rise from the dead and restore us to God. Stubbing your toe is natural. Grace is not. Mercy is not. We can no more be unmoved by the mercy of Jesus than a man with real leprosy, a patient with real cancer could be unmoved when a physician touches them and says, you're healed. When Jesus is the source of our salvation, he is the subject of our adoration. And so what do we do with this? How do we develop in ourselves a spirit of adoration, praise, and thanksgiving? Just three really quick things in closing that we can take away. It's hard when we talk about our hearts because what, you know, what do we do with our hearts? Like, they affect us. So how can we wisely think about this text? Three things. First, take account. This man knew what he saw when he looked to Jesus because he knew what he saw when he looked at his own arms. Take account of your own heart of your own sins, your own pain, your own brokenness. Take account of the world and notice that it cannot offer anything but a false healing and empty hopes. Look at all of that, but then realize that in the pace of this space ball flying around the sun, there is one who stops for you. There is one who goes to the cross for you. And in light of that, Number two, we praise him. We praise Jesus. So with your roommate or your spouse or maybe even your community group this week, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to read Ephesians chapter one. And I want you to write down from there everything that Jesus gives you in his mercy. Having looked at our own heart, now look at the heart of Jesus. Look at what he's done for you and let that lead you to praise him. It is, uses words like uh, immeasurable. Get a big piece of paper. Endless, infinite, beautiful, lovely. 
And today, as we prepare to sing, sing to him. Kids, kindergartners who are in here, sing. We practice things all the time. We practice math. We practice spelling. We practice cooking. Practice praise. Men, open your mouths. Abase yourself. Humble yourselves. Sing to this God. It is more embarrassing to be unmoved by grace than it is to be moved by it. Now, God made us different. We have different levels of affections and emotions. But God made us praise him soberly, sincerely, in light of yourself. Do that today. Practice doxology today. And lastly, fall in humble reliance upon him. Fall in humble reliance upon Jesus. See, it's dangerous when we talk about our emotions because then we begin to look to our emotions to save us. We begin to look at our responses to save us. Here we see a man overcome with emotions who ran back to Jesus. And there are two truths there that, that, that sit in tension. The first truth is that we are not saved by our emotions. Your faith does not save you. Your emotions do not save you. Your affections do not save you. The object of all of those saves you. We are saved by Christ alone, by nothing else. If we begin to assess the amount of what we do, that's why we looked and Jesus talked about faith as a mustard seed. If you begin to assess the amount of it, you've missed the point. The power is in the person. But people who are saved by Jesus do in a way fitting to their own personality and unique construction by God grow in their response to the gospel with increased affections and emotions. So if you're one who just whatever excites you, think about what excites you in life. What causes you to turn back and praise something? Use that as the standard. Where does the gospel match up in light of that? Your praising doesn't have to look like somebody else who has a different emotional reaction to something, but your praising should be consistent with the most utmost praise your heart naturally gives. And if you're one who struggles with that, which when we use ourselves as a standard is each and every one of us, then fall on him. Throw yourself at his feet and ask for mercy. This man's response didn't come, or his healing didn't come because he earned mercy. He responded joyfully because he was given mercy at the feet of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we have a great high priest who gives us mercy. One who is not inconvenienced by our woes. One who does not forget us when we are outside the camp, but one who moves towards us and gives us the grace we need to be restored first and foremost to him. So in just a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And as we do this, this is a physical, tangible way in which you can begin to take account, to praise him and to fall upon him. And so in a moment, we're gonna have people come up to do that, but I'm just gonna pray right now. And we're gonna to respond today to this text by taking and receiving, by worshiping and returning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your loving kindness to us. We ask that you produce in us, in our hearts, things that we cannot produce on our own, things this world cannot produce, things mere physical healing cannot produce, things only produced by the sovereign will and profound mercy of Jesus to save us from our sins. We ask that as we take your supper this morning, that you are honored and glorified in the midst of it, that as we praise you, that you are honored, and that as we praise you, we are transformed more and more into the image of your Son. We pray this in your name. Amen.